No fort sits overlooking the picturesque Weymouth Harbour, and its view spans all around the Isle of Portland. It is a remarkable Victorian fort, one that has provided England with protection through both world wars. This place in particular is special to me for a number of reasons. It's a place where I would beg my parents to allow me to visit, and it's a place where my love for history and interest was allowed to flourish. Featuring Cold War bunkers, two world wars, and some amazing history, join us today as we show you around No Fort. Once again, to support the channel, please subscribe. The spectacular view of Weymouth Bay and the surrounding area of Portland and Chesil Beach have been a haven for ships proceeding down English Channel for years. During the 16th century, tensions with Europe prompted Henry VIII to build two castles to protect the Portland roads. The headland which sits next to Weymouth Harbour has been used as a vantage point to observe raiders and invaders for centuries. Cannons on this headland existed long before a fort did. The history of no fort does not date back thousands of years. In 1860, a civil engineering contractor was awarded a contract to build a fort overlooking Weymouth Harbour. The first stage of this construction involved building a sea wall that would allow a level site to be formed on the sloping ground around the peninsula in which the fort would be built. Due to financial problems, they failed to complete this wall and the construction was handed over to the 26th company, Royal Engineers. The fort was constructed on three levels. The lowest level, or the magazine level, was intended to store gunpowder and shells. The middle level, or gun deck, was designed to accommodate 12 heavy muzzle-loaded cannons and to provide accommodation for the soldiers who were required to man the cannons. The top level would become the fort's ramparts and was a raised platform that could be used to fire muskets and guns down should the fort be attacked. The first soldiers to be garrisoned at the fort were the number 2 Battery Royal Artillery, a specialist gun emplacement unit trained in handling large cannons. These were responsible for the installation of the original cannons. All the cannons were rifle muzzle loaded at the fort. Spinal grooves were cut into the barrels of the cannons. When a shell was fired, it would spin as it travelled along the length of the barrel, improving its accuracy and range. In 1889, some of the gun's stores began being used for stores and living. By the 1890s, technology was moving on, and seven of the original cannons were replaced by 12.5-inch, 38-ton cannons. These new guns were capable of firing huge shells over three and a half miles. As Portland Harbour became a more important base for Britain's naval fleet, the fort became more significant too. Different guns throughout the start of the 1900s were added onto the fort. The RML guns were removed and replaced with breech-loading naval guns. Also, the fort's layout was changed by installing a number of hoists, which were used to bring shells from the magazines up onto the gun deck. Installing more guns upon the ramparts required strengthening works in the fort, and also in the early 1900s, gun pits and ammunition lockers were added. In the 1930s, a battery observation post was built in the southwest corner of the ramparts from where the guns could be controlled. When the war began in 1914, North Fort was fully manned, and by 1916, the threat to the shipping in the Portland area was considered minor, so the guns were removed and placed elsewhere. It wasn't until 1929 that guns were installed again at the fort. These were used for an annual training drill, and exercises would be carried out by an artillery unit and the navy to simulate attacks. In preparation for war, the fort artillery in conjunction with other forts and batteries around the port would carry out a number of different exercises. All this work would eventually pay off with the outbreak of the Second World War. Following the Munich crisis in 1938, the Dorset Regiment Royal Artillery manned the fort and were ready for action. During this year, the ditch outside the fort was filled to allow access into the fort. This replaced a narrow wooden drawbridge which had been used since the creation of the fortification. Also, some of the magazines on the south side of the fort were converted to now store anti-aircraft ammunition and hoist became electric, which would allow ammo to be carried up onto the ramparts easier. During the beginning of the Second World War, during the Phony War stage, all shipping was examined in Weymouth Harbour as previously practised. The No Fort would provide support for another fort, which was constructed upon the breakwaters. In September 1939, Nof received its own anti-aircraft defence in the form of a Vickers pom-pom gun, 
which was constructed and placed in the northwest corner of the ramparts. This was then placed with a Beaufort's gun. Today, the North Gardens that flank the fort has a car park, but during World War II, lots of other guns would have been placed here. Early in July 1940, the fort fired its first and last shot in anger. A darkened ship approached at night and did not answer when challenged. A warning shot was fired across the bow of what turned out to be a fishing boat loaded with refugees from Alderney. This vessel was then escorted into Weymouth Harbour with its passengers being given accommodation in the town. Following the Battle of Britain, the threat of invasion from the Germans decreased and the fort became the centre of offensive operations in the Channel, culminating in the invasion of France in June 1944. US troops would embark upon their mission for D-Day from Weymouth and Portland, and this area was guarded by the fort throughout the supply period, and ships were guarded during the initial landings. Following the end of the Second World War, there were efforts to update the fort with the addition of radar to direct the guns. However, by the mid-1950s, the fort became rather obsolete. The guns would leave the fort, and it would become extremely overgrown. In the 1980s, though, the fort would be cleared, and was opened as a tourist attraction, and the number of visitors would continue to grow every year. Let's show you around the different exhibitions in No Fort, including the Cold War Bunker, the Ghost Tunnels, and various Second World War and Victorian exhibitions and gun decks. When I was a child, walking up to this entrance, I would always be filled with excitement. The entrance doesn't look too spectacular, however it is fitted with a portcullis. Before the track road was added, a wooden drawbridge would have been here, which could have been brought up in case of attack, isolating the fort. The entrance to No Fort today leads into a gift shop. However, you can imagine the soldiers wandering under the archway, if they would just had some leave, back from exploring the town of Weymouth. The area around the entrance, which today is a car park, was at one time a fully operational gunnery battery, which was built into the headland. The parade ground at No Fort is a brilliant reminder of military history. When leaving the entrance, you are transported into this huge semicircular courtyard. Most Victorian defensive fortifications were built with parade grounds within them. We've previously seen one at Western Heights in Dover, however the one at No Fort is spectacular. It's remarkably preserved and well looked after. On this area, troops which were garrisoned here would have met up regularly, practiced military drills and paraded. Practice marches would also have taken place here, as would the inspection of the soldiers. In today's time, every now and then, Victorian reenactment groups get together and reenact shooting and firing cannons on this space. Today, this room may just look like a room that houses a rather large torpedo and many different cases containing models of boats. However, what is clear is that this room would have had a different purpose. If you look at the back wall, you'll see a firing port for a cannon, and you can also see some of the fittings on the ceilings and the floor. One of the things that made me obsess about history was some of the displays that I would see on days out. This is one in particular that hasn't changed since I was a kid. This display shows what a Second World War shop would have looked like throughout the era in which rationing was in force. You can see many 1940s style jars and boxes on the walls. You can imagine walking in here with your ration book and being given what we would deem today to be a small amount of food. However, this process was essential for the war effort in England. As with the previous room which housed a torpedo, this room may just look like it houses a number of different searchlights and small cannons. However, this is also a cannon emplacement and gun room. One of the most memorable parts of No Fort is a gun deck. This platform on this level was used to protect Weymouth Harbour and huge cannons would have been based in this area to do the job. You will notice a number of different beds and accommodations in this room. That's because the soldiers who were garrisoned here were required 24-7 in case of an invasion, so usually the men would sleep in very close proximity to their guns. You can see around the barracks as if the soldiers were here at the moment, with playing cards on the table for entertainment. You can also see the uniforms of the soldiers hung up by their beds, which don't look hugely comfy, but fold away for more space. You can also see the cabinets that each of the soldiers had with their ID numbers on. The cannons on the gun deck are colossal, and these replicas are full size to show the true size of the threat that England faced. These cannons would have been the most up-to-date and latest in Victorian technology. 
you'll see the original fittings in this room on the floor, and also on the ceiling. On the floor, you'll see that the guns could be traversed using the semicircular track on the floor, and on the ceiling, the fittings would help control the recoil of the gun. In this room, you can also see the shell hoists. These were connected to the magazines and the stores found in the basement. These hoists would bring shells and ammo up from the basement, where it was safer to store them after they were made in the magazines. By descending into the basement after visiting the gun deck, you were taken into the heart of the fort. Before taking a trip into the Second World War, you can see the nurses station exhibit, which shows you how medical care was administered. The basement is made up of a number of different exhibitions, but we'll show you what their Victorian purpose was too. The Weymouth at War exhibition documents an attack from the air on Weymouth from the Luftwaffe. As a kid, entering this room and seeing the display of the mannequins carrying an injured girl used to scare me. However, this shows the true horror of an air attack during the Second World War. The basement level is also home to the NAFI. This is a place where soldiers would escape to when they were not needed to defend the fort during the Second World War. The NAFI would facilitate soldiers' dances, host entertainment events, and also allow soldiers to spend some money on some luxuries. People could mix together, share stories, share a dance and also in some instances fall in love. You can also see though in this room, the reminders of the conflict through propaganda posters, so soldiers weren't completely able to escape the war. One of the most fascinating parts of the fort is definitely the Cold War Bunker and Communications Centre. When entering this part of the fort, you can see the huge Cold War style radiation proof doors that are in use. The Cold War Bunker immerses you into the realities of the conflict and tells you the story of what people would have heard in the event of a nuclear attack. Listen for a few minutes to hear the audio. Until you are told it's safe to come out. The message that the immediate danger has passed will be given by the silence and repeated on this way. Make sure that the gas and all fuel supplies are turned off and that all fires are extinguished. Water must be rationed and used only for essential drinking and cooking purposes. It must not be used for flushing batteries. Ration your food supply. It may have to last you for 14 days or more. We shall repeat this broadcast in two hours' time. Stay tuned to this way, then. Switch your radios off now to save your batteries until we come on the air again. This is the end of this broadcast. The gun exhibition, which is housed in this room today, shows lots of different weaponry from around the world. This room, however, would have been intended as a storage room for shells needed for the guns. The basement of the fort is linked up by a number of different passageways and doors. The doors would have been steel and could have been locked in case the fort was breached, isolating and slowing down invaders. The passageways are rather narrow and feel warlike. They lead onto a number of different exhibitions and shell stores that were used during the Victorian times and also in the Second World War to store ammunition. One of the displays in these passageways is a rather amazing model of the D-Day invasion. The magazines are housed within the basement level. The magazines today contain many different exhibitions documenting important events in Weymouth's history. The magazines during the Victorian times were where the shells and ammunition would have been made. These were kept underground in case enemy shells would have landed in close vicinity and caused a huge explosion. The magazines are rather small rooms. Outside of these rooms are cloakrooms where soldiers would have to change clothes. This area of the fort was very dangerous. Any small spark that could be produced could have led to the whole fort blowing up. The magazines and basement are connected to the ramparts by shell hoists and there is also a ramp that links the basement to the parade ground. Shell hoists were so important to the fort, these could quickly allow ammunition to be taken up to the guns on the top of the ramparts. Today, the ramparts at No Fort are a spectacle, and offer some incredible views of Portland, Weymouth and the Jurassic Coast. The ramparts are the upper level of the fort, in which the gunnery platforms on, and they offer a great view of the parade ground, and a number of different access points are here, including stairways to get quick access to the lower levels of the fort. If an attack was on the horizon, you can imagine the rush from the lower levels of the fort onto the ramparts for the soldiers to man the guns. The observation post is one of the most important parts of the fort. Today it houses a couple of exhibitions and some incredible viewing points. The exhibition in the lower part of the post 
shows some of the Morse code and transmission equipment that was used in this area of the fort. The observation post was the place where the commander of the fort would stand and watch the Isle of Portland and the English Channel in case of invasion. From this point, people could see the practices for D-Day that were taking place in Portland. The post doesn't have much of its original equipment left today, however the views of Portland are rather spectacular and one of my favourite. From this point, you can also see Portland Castle on the horizon. You can really see why the gun platforms were placed upon this headland when walking around the ramparts. From this position, soldiers would have been able to defend not only Portland and a large part of the English Channel, but also the town of Weymouth and surrounding areas. Today, the gun platforms still exist around the fort, however, some of the guns are missing. When I was a child, there were guns on these platforms and you could sit on them, pretending you're one of the soldiers whose job it is to defend England. This 6 inch gun emplacement is one of three that were placed on the ramparts in 1903. Major engineering work had to be done to facilitate these guns. Also around here, you can see the lockers where shells and cartridges were stored and being locked away in the concrete retaining walls. The casemates below this position were converted into magazines and the 6 inch guns were decommissioned in 1956. The 3.7 inch anti-aircraft guns arrived at North Fort around the time of World War II due to the threat from the sky that the Luftwaffe posed. Many of these AA guns were placed around Britain with the task of protecting the areas from German bombers or fighter aircraft. The same goes for the grey AA gun that overlooks Weymouth Harbour. These defences were so important in protecting the harbour at Weymouth and also Portland where many of the military ships were based. The Barbican is one of the most oldest parts of the fort. A Barbican is a defensive position made to defend the entrance of a castle. This particular one is rather small, however by following the passageway you can see a number of musket slots. Here, a defender was able to fire down upon attackers in relative safety, being protected by the walls of the Barbican. The gunnery position that contains the Mephors gun offers some amazing views of Weymouth Bay. This position was created to defend the town of Weymouth and also the vital harbour. From here, you can imagine soldiers keeping an eye out for the Messerschmitts and bombers, ready to take them down should they be spotted on the horizon. Overall, No. 4 is one of my favourite places to visit in the whole of England. Every year as a family, we would visit Weymouth and I would beg my parents to take me in. I'd forever be captivated with the exhibitions and be intrigued by what I was seeing. Even from a young age, my mind would be intrigued about the lives of the people who worked here or were stationed here. Today the fort offers a trip down memory lane and a view into what life would have been like during the Second World War. It tells the story of Weymouth at war, features incredible artefacts of historical importance and documents the importance that the fort had in protecting England from invasion or attack. It's an interesting walk around the basement tunnels, whilst considering the Victorian soldiers who would frequent these areas, building cartridges and shells in dangerous conditions in the magazines. It's also interesting to visit the Cold War nuclear attack bunker, but most of all, it's a place where history is brought to life. No fort really is a remarkable and incredibly preserved look at military history in days gone by. Once again, thank you for watching. Stay tuned at the end of the video to see us walking through the ghost tunnels. To support the channel, please subscribe. Thank you once again and take care. That is a hundred pound, isn't it? Yeah. It's got to be some of that there, isn't it? What's around the corner? That's it. That's it. It's the end. Not that side.